Happy Tuesday, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Pathfinder presented by Payload. I'm your host, Mo Islam, and today I'm very excited to have Ian Cinnamon on the show, the CEO and co-founder of Apex Space, a startup aiming to standardize satellite bus manufacturing. But before we bring Ian on, I would like to introduce the sponsor of today's episode, Spider Oak Mission Systems, a leader in space cybersecurity. Spider Oak's Orbit Secure product is the industry standard for ephemeral key creation, rotation, and assignment for secure, need-to-know communications in space. Cybersecurity will continue to be a prominent issue in high-stakes environments like space, so companies should carefully consider their cyber planning. Spider Oak Mission Systems is a U.S.-based software company that builds space cybersecurity products and solutions for civilian, military, and commercial space operations. Their products leverage a unique combination of zero-trust encryption and private blockchain, ensuring the confidentiality, integrity, and availability for your most sensitive data in the zero-gravity environments you depend on. Check out their website, spideroak-ms.com, for more information. Ian, welcome to the show. Hey, hey Mo, how's it going? Great to be here. So you're gonna hate uh, you're gonna hate me for starting off here, um, but before um, we get into Apex, I do need to hear the origin story of your name. So, oh, amazing! Ian, yes, well, what a great name! I want to hear. Uh, you know where you're from where's your family from and i, I got to hear how the last name came to be <laughs> so it, i'm sure you've had the spice cinnamon before right <laughs> yes <laughs> well it, it's amazing my great ancestors actually invented it right it was genetically engineered and they created it um which is incredible so that's why of course you know had the money to start apex and did all that <laughs> Obviously, I'm kidding. Uh, I wish that was the word. Some people believe me, though, when I say that. I mean, that was uh, clearly you've gotten this question before and you've rehearsed that. That was perfect. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. No, it's, it's actually uh, pretty funny. So I grew up in Los Angeles. Uh, my parents um, both grew up in the US, but you know, the generation before that came over and we're Jewish and uh, from kind of Poland, Russia area. So the hypothesis is. Our name used to be something like Cinemoski or something like that, that had kind of that slightly more Eastern European flair to it. Mm -hmm. But when uh, my ancestors came over to America, I think the immigration official might have had Cinnamon Toast Crunch for breakfast or something of that nature and said, you all are now the Cinnamons. So it's a, uh, I have to say, it's a pretty fun name to have. It's very memorable. Sometimes people are a little bit confused whether I have a satellite company or I should own a bakery. Um, <laughs> but I, I love it. I think it's incredibly memorable. Uh, there's weirdly enough, uh, other people have like picked pseudonyms and used Ian Cinnamon for other uh, not so great purposes, which is pretty funny. So if you Google it, there's like always a battle for which Ian Cinnamon is on top. Oh, uh, but I intend to always win that. That's funny. That's okay. So that that's actually a pretty, pretty darn good story. Um, so so your family um, immigrated here in, in, in when you said? Uh, a, a few generations ago. So it's, it. you know, my, my parents both grew up uh, in, in the U.S. Okay, got it. Well, I appreciate you um, humoring me uh, with that initial question. So thank you for that. Of course. Uh, but okay, let's, let's get into it. Tell me about Apex. You raised um, a substantial seed round last fall um, led by A16Z. Um, participation from a lot of other great investors. What is it that you are building that captured the attention of these investors? It's a great question. So fundamentally, our goal is to be the largest supplier of satellite platforms in the galaxy. Now, there's a lot in that statement. So we could rewind for a second and unpack that. So we manufacture something called satellite buses. And even if you're in the industry, you might not be super familiar with the distinction between a spacecraft or satellite or satellite bus. So if it's okay with you, we could take a quick step back and just define what that is. Sure. So fundamentally, rockets that we're all familiar with from SpaceX and Relativity and Astra and all these other and Rocket Lab and all these great companies, they launch satellites or spacecraft into space. Now, when you launch something into space, you're, let's say you're launching some sort of camera system to observe the earth or a communications dish or, you know, some sort of robotic arm for an OTV company, whatever it may be. You can't just put the camera up into space, right? You need to give it power. You need to let it communicate down to earth. You need to make sure it's able to point and know where it's pointing. All of those different elements. And in order for that camera or that sensor or whatever it is, but we'll call that payload, in order for that payload to be able to survive in space, you attach it to what's called a satellite bus. And a satellite bus is the physical enclosure, it's the solar panels, it's the ADCS system, the flight computer, the radios, all of the equipment 
that allows that payload to survive and thrive and operate in space. So fundamentally, if you want to put something up in space, you'll go design your payload, you'll go purchase or build the satellite bus, you put the two of them together, satellite bus plus payload equals functioning satellite or spacecraft, we tend to use those interchangeably. Sure. So so, so that makes sense. Now, um, to, since we're since we've kind of taken a step back, satellite buses are effectively the enclosure for the payloads. Um, you know, this has been something that companies, very well-funded companies have been doing for a very long time. Doesn't seem like at, at its surface where, something that you can actually innovate really on much. What, what is it that you guys are doing differently? It, it, it's a great question. So if you look at the market over the last several decades, right? Satellite buses, they're not some crazy new invention. We're not, you know, redefining the laws of physics or anything like that. They've been built for decades. But fundamentally, the satellite buses that are on the market today were catering to the existing launch market over the last several 20, 30 years. And the launch market over the last 20 or 30 years was, you know, infrequent, very expensive rides into space. And because of that, when people were building these satellite buses, they would be bespoke products with new non recurring engineering or NRE for short to really custom design the satellite bus to meet the exact needs of the payload and the rocket. And what that resulted in was if you want to buy a satellite bus, you're looking at a lead time of anywhere from two to four years. You're looking at huge variability on the price point. Like, you know, I've seen satellite buses being quoted from anywhere from three to 30 million for very, very similar platforms. And you're looking at low reliability. And the reason for the low reliability is if you're doing new engineering work for every bus that you produce, there's going to be bugs, right? It's the nature of doing engineering work. There's always going to be problems. So fundamentally, that was fine when the launches were infrequent and very expensive. We were not in a rush to build these satellite buses. But today, thanks to the companies like SpaceX and Rocket Lab and all of the other amazing launch providers that have popped up, the launch system has pretty much proliferated. The cost has dropped massively, meaning there's a huge demand to say, okay, we can get stuff into space. What are we putting in space? And if you have to wait years to put that thing in space, the business model no longer works out. So the demand for these spacecraft has shot up massively. And the current providers that are on the market are, again, they're, you know, they're great. They've done an amazing job over the last several decades, but they're very good at doing it their way, which is we're going to take several years. We're going to custom design your satellite bus. There's no idea of productization saying we are going to take this, turn it into a product, stop iterating on it and just produce this. Right. That idea is very foreign in this industry. And that's, what, that's exactly what we're doing. So companies that try to do this in-house, why does that development take so long? Why is it so difficult and expensive? So there are certain skill sets you need to put a you know, functioning spacecraft up into space. I would actually argue it's, we could debate this all day long, whether launch is more complicated or satellites are more complicated. Uh, I'm just going to make a quick pitch for why satellites are harder. But a satellite has to survive for 5 years, 10 years, 15, 20 years, depending on you know, the lifespan of it. It has to go through every 90 minutes it's orbiting Earth and going through, you know, being in direct sunlight to being in the frigid cold and all of that temperature cycling. And it has to continue to operate. Like, think about, I'm sure, uh, Mo, you probably have a relatively new iPhone or whatever phone you're using. Sure. Um, imagine your phone from five years ago, if you still have to use that today, every single day. Like, I bet it would barely work. And with satellites, you can't have that. It, you can't go up and repair it. You can't replace the battery. The thing has to work. So I'd argue they're much harder to build. And because of that, if you're trying to build these satellites in-house, you need a very specialized team that knows how to do it, and you need a significant amount of capital expenses to buy all the equipment that you need. And usually, if you're going to go build this in-house, you're going to go buy all that equipment. It's going to take you a couple years to spin up. Usually, the industry tends to think about it as you need a team of at least 20 to 30 and about $15 million to spin up in-house manufacturing of satellites. But then once you do that, you could think about it as... The company is not specialized in building these really quickly. They're specialized in building exactly what they need. So they right. still have this problem of not being able to produce fast enough. But on top of that, all of the capital equipment that they're buying, right? The test equipment, the vibe tables, the TVAC, uh, the milling equipment, whatever it may be, the utilization rate on all of that equipment is actually fairly low. Yet they bought all this equipment. It's super expensive. They're not really able to, you know, use it to its fullest extent. So the economics are not great. So um, th there, there's two companies that come to mind, one which is public, which is Terran Orbital, um, large satellite bus manufacturing business, and another that's private, York, that 
actually, um, interestingly enough, um, just commanded a very significant valuation through a recent private equity transaction, uh, York Space. Um, tell me a little bit about why you don't think like a Terran or a York could re-engineer their manufacturing processes towards standardization. And maybe there's two questions there. First is like, um, are they incentivized to do so in any way, shape or form? Um, and, uh, you know, if, if they wanted to, why it would be so difficult for them to do so? It, it, it's a great question. Fundamentally, if you look at the market, there are certain purchasers out there who say, I want to move really fast. I want to take whatever product you have, and I want to be able to launch it into space. There are other customers out there who say, hey, I have a little bit more of the traditional way of thinking. I am going to tell you exactly what I want you to build, and I want you to go build that for me. And if you look at the contracts that Tranorbital has won, York Space has won, and by the way, these are both incredible companies. I have a ton of respect for both Mark and Dirk, amazing CEOs, amazing entrepreneurs who have started these. They are very much focused on saying, what contracts are we able to bring in? And then how do we ensure that our engineering team can go build whatever is needed to go meet those contract needs? And a great example of this is, you know, let's take York for a second. They've had tremendous success on the SDA contracts that they've been able to win. Now, if you dive one level deeper, though, York is effectively a company that's been bootstrapped off the backs of contracts, government contracts that they've been able to win over the course of well over a decade. And if you're in a position where your business and your employee's livelihood is dependent on winning every single contract, they're never going to say no to any given customer because, frankly, they need to be in a position where they can do that. And they've done a good job of it, right? They're meeting that very specific need. Similarly, you have a company like Tran Orbital, who, you know, they got their start as tie back and then they, you know, they turned that into Tran Orbital and took it public. Done amazing work, but very, very similar where they're going out and they're saying, okay, what are the, you know, big contracts that we're able to get? We're a public company. We have quarterly earnings to report. We need to show that consistency. And you tend to operate in a very different way where it's harder to invest in that R and D to build a scalable product where, you know, your shareholders are analyzing you. Every 90 days saying, what has changed? Show me that improvement. So both of these companies tend to be in a position where they're saying yes to any contract that comes in. And again, massive respect for both these companies. And for their business models, it makes a lot of sense. For us, however, we are one of the only satellite bus companies in the world to have ever raised venture capital dollars in order for the primary purpose of being able to say no to customers who are not a fit for us. So if a customer approaches us and says, hey, I see that you have this product line on your website. Uh, if only you were able to do X, Y, and Z, I would go buy it from you. Our response is, thanks so much. As we iterate on future product designs, we'll take that into consideration. But right now, we don't have a product to sell you. We recommend you go work with a York or Tran Orbital or one of these others. We are very happy to be willing to do that. Yeah, that's a great point. And you had, you had, a, you, you hit on a few things that I want to touch on, um, particularly the capital that's been going into a segment like satellite buses versus other areas of the market. But before we touch on that, so, um, as real, so, so looking at, um, Taryn and York's customer base, right? Obviously a big part of that, you mentioned the transport layer. A big part of that is government. Now, I would argue that commercial companies, especially new age businesses, the new startups, the new innovative startups that are backed by like talented folks like yourself. Um, have a first principles based approach to a lot of these issues and problems, and also think about productization. And I think that 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 methodology and that mode of thinking is 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 what's carrying a lot of the industry forward so quickly. Um, the government is not like that typically, <laughs> um, and when the government needs something, they you know they have different requirements and customizations and. How, and, and there's no question that, yes, the commercial market is going to be a big customer for Apex, but the government's going to be a big customer for Apex as well. How do you strike that balance where you can you achieve standardization, but you're also able to meet the needs of a complex customer like the government where you know, they're not always thinking about innovation or not innovation. They're not thinking about efficiency all the time, right? And, and, cost, and, and cost also... You know, there's some relative, you know, the government can be somewhat agnostic to cost, right? So that might not be their biggest priority. So uh, tell me how you think about that. It, it, it's a great point. Fundamentally, Apex is a dual use company, right? Meaning we're serving both the commercial and the government markets. And I would love to see as we grow that it really is a 50 50 split between the commercial and the government markets. 
That is very important. It's core to our DNA. You're spot on that many of these government contracts are very particular. And frankly, they're used to the world of cost plus contracting where they're saying, hey, we've designed this beautiful, perfect spacecraft. Everyone go bid on it and let us know how much it'll cost and then add on whatever your you know, profit's going to be on that. Not every buyer in government feels that way. Some do, some don't. So a great example of this is you know, the um, Tactical Responsive Space Initiative, which is effectively the idea the government wants to be able to ensure that if there's incidents such as cyber attacks or ASATs, how can we make sure that the US government is equipped to launch a replacement satellite up within 24 hours? And the first step of that is, well, launches take months or years to plan. First, we need to pull in launch. Obviously, look at all the number of companies that have popped up. Great job stimulating that. Then the government realized, okay, well, if we can launch quickly, what are we going to launch? And then obviously satellite buses come to mind, right? You need a, a way of basically having satellite buses that are COTS commercial off the shelf or they're not custom designing it every time. So initiatives like that are very, very interested in exactly what we're doing, which is this productized approach where they can truly buy them ahead of time and keep them on the shelf. There are other groups within, for example, the intelligence community that are very curious about what the commercial markets are pushing forward and trying to learn to adapt to that. And then, like we were talking about earlier with York, uh, the Space Development Agency, or SDA, while yes, they might have put out very specialized requirements, we've been in a very fortunate position to be in many dialogues with uh, some of the members of SDA to really try to understand their willingness to adapt to a more COTS approach. And we've so far gotten very positive feedback. Now, to be very clear, though, that doesn't mean that overnight or even over the course of the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, the entire government's going to shift from this cost plus, very specific NRE focus to this, you know, hey, we're going to go buy a commercial off the shelf productized uh, satellite bus. But our strong belief is there is a shift, a growing shift to buying more of these productized satellite buses and in general, just productized um, products that the government's buying across all industries, not just space. And this is a growing trend that will continue to grow for years and years and hopefully decades to come. So we believe that as we grow, the government's going to be shifting more into that mindset. But again, I am a firm believer that it's not like we're going to go out and say, okay, great, York and Tran Orbital and uh, Maxar and you know all these other amazing satellite companies out there, you're gone, Apex beat you. Like That's not the case at all. The way that we think about it is, there's going to be a great industry for them to go bid on those cost plus contracts to be able to focus on that area. But we also think there's going to be tens of billions of dollars of government customers for us that require and need that commercial off the shelf satellite bus. Uh, so you're you're alluding a little bit to the existence of multiple companies, right? In this in this in this segment, which lends one to believe that you believe it, it's a it's a big market. <laughs> How do you quantify market? Um, the size of the market uh, today versus what it'll look like in five to 10 years. And maybe if you don't mind, talk, talk to me a little bit about where you think your customer mix will look like, you know, next one year versus, you know, in 10 years. Absolutely. So the way that we quantify the market is, you know, just reading multiple reports uh, that have come out today, the satellite bus market is known as about a $33 billion market. And within that market, that is people purchasing satellite buses. And that's split between huge satellite buses, right? These you know, massive, multi-ton geostationary buses, the microsats that are about the size of a refrigerator, call it 200 to 800 kilograms, that's our sweet spot, and then CubeSats. And if you look at that pie chart of that $33 billion market, the bulk of it is in our size class, right? That kind of uh, what we call microsats or small sats. And that's part of the reason we chose to specialize there. So Already, you know, it's a uh, several tens of billions dollar large market, but that doesn't include all of the companies that have gone in house and said we're going to go vertically integrate these satellite buses. And what we've noticed is, you know, despite the fact that some of these companies have invested tens of millions of dollars of going in house, they are feeling the pain point of the fact that they are specialists in building the exact satellite bus they need for their payload, not specialists in design for manufacturing not specialists in software, not being able to actually produce these at the scale they need. So, you know, we can't go into too many specifics yet, but we've got into great dialogues with several well-known companies that have gone fully in-house 
to say, well, what would it look like if you parallel path that? You still were able to produce in-house in order to kind of push the edge forward, but your payload also happened to be compatible with a externally provided bus. And we think the market will grow quite a bit from that as the trend increases of saying, well, you don't have to go in-house. There's options like Apex out there that cater to your needs. The second big push that we're seeing on the market right now is there's a huge trend away from these very expensive, large geostationary satellites to a much larger number of low Earth orbit satellites. And honestly, Starlink did an amazing job of pioneering this mentality of saying, hey, look, we're just going to launch tens of thousands of satellites, and that is going to blanket the Earth in connectivity, and we are going to be good. And obviously, most companies can't afford to launch tens of thousands of satellites. But the idea of saying, hey, you know what? Like, We can get lower latency. And sure, the satellites are going to deorbit in five years and not last 20 years. But wait, the cost comes way down. And if they're deorbiting every five years, the math actually makes sense because we could put up new technology then every five years right. and we're not stuck with 15 year old technology on, you know, those old geostationary satellites. So I think that trend of moving from geo to Leo will also increase the market size quite a bit. And that's going to continue. It's already starting, but it'll continue to occur over the next five years or so. And then what I'm incredibly excited for is call it five to 15 years out because I, I never feel confident giving an exact timeline these super heavy launch vehicles will come online. Starship, Taran R, all, you know, all of Rocket Lab, all these other companies who are working on it. And when that happens, the cost of launch will decrease even more. And what that means is the bottleneck that is already on spacecraft will get a lot worse. And a company like Apex needs to go solve that gap and the market will grow quite a bit from that. That's right. So, um, so you, you, you brought up something that made me think of a conversation I had with a member of management from one of the companies that we've mentioned. And I'm going to take a quick pivot for a second um, away from buses into refueling. And we were having a debate about the, refu- the, the market for refueling, especially in Leo. And you mentioned my phone earlier, which I agree with you. If I had my iPhone from five, 10 years ago, it would not be a pleasant experience. So what do you think about the market for refueling technology in Leo? And I ask that because uh, as you think about bus build, do you see that this ultimately becomes, I don't know if I want to use commodity, commoditize is the right word, but there's a level of innovation that occurs in this technology every three to five years that it's not going to make sense for you to refuel your assets in Leo, right? So uh, have you spent some time, have you thought about that? And just kind of curious if you have any strong thoughts about about, about the refueling market in Leo. <laughs> Yeah, what's funny, I actually have spent quite a bit of time thinking about this. So it's a, 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 I, I love that you bring it up. So the way that I think about it is we got to separate out um, two things. So one, the bus side from the payload side, and then within the payload side, what the payload is. So fundamentally, on the satellite bus side, satellite buses have been using the same technology for the last several decades, right? If you like the fundamentals of a satellite bus in Leo, right? Reaction wheels, you know, different types of EP or monoprop chemprop systems gas solar panels, right? Like, sure, there's some innovations like moving to different solar panel technology, slightly lowering the cost, but it's not fundamentally changing what a satellite bus can do, right? That's pretty much the same. So I would argue from the satellite bus side, you know, sure, go refuel that and keep that bus alive from five years to 10 years to 15 years. Now, there are some things to keep in mind, like the longer you're up there, the more you have to deal with radiation and, you know, uh, different upsets, et cetera, but that's all manageable. I would say then if you focus refueling more on the payload side and say, does it make sense to keep those same payloads up in space longer? And that's more similar to that phone analogy we mentioned earlier. I think it really depends on the payload. So if you're a Earth observation company and you're building cameras for space and you want to image space, camera technology is improving incredibly quickly. And it probably almost certainly makes sense to launch more and more satellites. But I would argue that maybe it also makes sense to refuel the ones that are already up there. Because then you just have more coverage of the Earth constantly, and you could get to a higher cadence of basically revisit rates, getting more data down, et cetera. But then if you look at different types of payloads, such as you know communication payloads, for example, you know those might not change quite as frequently, right? Maybe the RF, the radio technology really hasn't changed as much. And that you, you can design the satellite to say, hey, we're going to put a lot less fuel on this. We're not necessarily going to design the satellite to, you know, last 20 years, but we're going to put one year's worth of fuel. And it's actually a better cost equation to go refuel this thing every year and keep it going until we choose to let it deorbit. 
And I think those are all cost equations that are going to dynamically change as the cost of launch changes, cost of satellite buses change, et cetera. But I do think for certain payloads, the refueling market absolutely makes sense. And for other types of payloads, it makes no sense. So I think uh, it, it's one of those things where there's no blanket yes or no answer. It's more of a depends on the situation. Very balanced answer. Very balanced answer. I'm sure our, ref- our friends in the refueling industry will appreciate that. <laughs> I do want to take a quick um, uh, pivot back into a point you made on more of the, um, the investor capital uh, you know, you, you talked about launch at one point, um, which was one of the big bottlenecks, right? The cost of launch. And, you know, there's been in billions of dollars of capital that have gone into um, launch companies to help get that cost down. Um, why do you feel like the bus side of things hasn't seen that same level of uh, capital flow? Because it is just as important of uh, just as important part of the equation. And do you think that that's something that's starting to change? Do you, do you think that there's going to be more dollars, that more venture, I'll say more venture dollars, because the private equity has been in the bus, the satellite manufacturing bus, bus side for quite some time. But just as, as when, when you compare kind of launch versus satellite um, manufacturing. I think it really comes down to the order of operations. So if you had, if you, let's say you put on Modi VC over here, right? So let's say you put on your investor hat. If you were to have funded a company like Apex five years ago, the market wouldn't be there. The timing would have been off mm-hmm. because you wouldn't have been able to get launches as quickly as you need, right? Fundamentally, Apex solves three core issues, which is how do we increase the speed at which we can get somebody's satellite bus? How do we increase the reliability of the satellite bus? And how do we get to incredibly transparent and upfront pricing where people aren't surprised later? And that first one, speed, is the most important factor for our customers. And if you were to rewind five years, if you got the satellite bus sooner, there was no way to get it to space, right? There was no ride to get up there on. So you had to start with the launch side because that was the bottleneck previously. It's only really been in the last year or two that the bottleneck has shifted over to the bus side. And as launch became more proliferated, it wasn't like overnight okay, great. We now need more buses. All of the companies that were making buses, their capacity got eaten up. SDA launched. And by launch, I mean the organization really started purchasing a lot of this stuff. Uh, you know, They're still working on getting more satellites up and launching in that, in that term, um, meaning a lot more capacity got eaten up. And suddenly that bus bottleneck got so tight. And that's where we stepped in. I really believe that while investors love, have always loved launch because frankly, I mean, there's just something really special about launch, like being able to see something that you created with this amazing fireball underneath go up into the stars. I mean, it's incredible. It's very sexy. People love it, but satellites are where the money is made, right? Like you make money per day in orbit. And if you get that faster, you can solve for that. So I think investors are starting to see that a lot more. I think a lot more venture capital dollars are going to be flying into you know, other bus companies that are out there. We're big fans. You know, we've seen a few pop up over the last year or so. We're very big fans of them. We hope a lot more money flows into them, flows into us as we need it, et cetera. So uh, we see that uh, trend definitely shifting towards buses. Now, um, without giving away any special sauce, um, what is the most difficult part of the standardization process of bus manufacturing? Or w- what what has been sort of the 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 maybe not the pain point so far, but the challenge so far that might kind of lend itself to why you ultimately will succeed. So we're very open kimono here. So I'll tell you the three core things, right? So the first one, frankly, is being able to say no to customers. Most important thing. If you say yes to everyone who comes to you and wants to give you some money, wants to work with you, you are going to end up being very similar to a York space or a train orbital. Again, amazing companies. Right? They've had amazing outcomes, but that's just not the type of company that we're trying to build. So I would say number one. The second and third are more on the technology side. And the first one of those is the design for manufacturing approach. How do we ensure that everything that we're building does not have to go through a new engineering process, new you know, NRE every single time that we're putting a different payload on it or a different configuration package? We want to predefine all those configuration packages. So as they're being built on the manufacturing line, Somebody can just swap in different solar panels, different reaction wheels, and so on. And then the third element, which I think is really core to our DNA and personally to my DNA, is software. 
You could have all of the best hardware in the world, all the best manufacturing processes, but one of the largest causes of failures of spacecraft is software-based. And the reason for that is as you swap in new hardware, you have to redo all the embedded code, redo all the drivers, get everything to work together. It's an incredibly complicated system. But if we're able to work with some of the amazing offerings on the market and make sure that our software team, the way we think about software, is truly on the cutting edge, we're going to be in a great position to be able to truly build these at scale. Ian, we're going to take a quick break for a message from our sponsors. But when we return, I know you have some very exciting news to share with the world. So to the audience, just hang with us for a second. Space is the new frontier for cybersecurity and securing space-based assets will become an even higher priority for companies and governments around the world. Spider Oak Mission Systems builds space cybersecurity products and solutions for civilian, military, and commercial space operations. The Orbit Secure protocol utilizes no-knowledge encryption and blockchain capabilities to deliver secure communications for hybrid space architectures. As the threat of cybersecurity in space grows, Spider Oak has used its cybersecurity expertise to develop the space industry-specific product to ensure mission security in orbits across the systems. Check out their website, spideroak.ms.com, for more information. All right, Ian, welcome back. Thanks I so know much. We have um, some exciting news to share. So I'm going to turn it over to you because it sounds like you guys are ready for a launch pretty soon. (laughs) Yes. So we are big believers in not just telling people we're going to do things, but showing people that we actually are able to do it. So we are incredibly excited to announce today that we are officially manifested on SpaceX's Transporter 10 launch, which is launching no earlier than January 2024. And for us, that really is able... It's, it's a huge sign that we can show the market and tell the market that we are really building spacecraft in a matter of months, not years. And eventually, we're going to get that down to weeks. And as we get to that SpaceX Transporter 10 launch, that will make us the fastest company in history to go from a clean sheet design to launch in our size class of spacecraft. So we are, uh, could not be more excited to be working full speed ahead for that launch uh, coming up in just nine months from now. So uh, awesome and like, really great accomplishment, especially the speed. Can you tell me, how, I mean, how, how did you guys do it so fast? <laughs> it's a good question. So uh, it really all, frankly, comes down to the team, right? We needed to bring together the what we believe is the only team in the world capable of meshing together three core skills, right? One is, how do you build spacecraft? Another one is, how are we on the cutting edge of software? And then three, how do we actually manufacture this thing quickly and at scale? And uh, we were able to do it, right? So um, I have an incredible co-founder, our CTO, Max. He spent his career effectively in the role of taking a given component and figuring out how do I go build X number of these per week, per month, per year, whatever the cadence is. That was his single job. When he was at SpaceX, he did this on over 500 different sub-assemblies, and he was director of engineering at Astra, working on both uh, their spacecraft components as well as rockets. And then beyond that, right, we've just put together a sensational team. So Thomas, who's our director of spacecraft, he worked at the Boeing subsidiary Millennium uh, before leading multiple satellites uh, projects at Rocket Lab. Chuck, uh, our thermal engineer, he was JPL's top thermal engineer for 25 years. Kabir, Russell, and Brian lead all of our software efforts. Andrew, who runs our BD, you know, he's closed well over $100 million in deals. So just a brilliant team who's able to bring all of this together. You're leaving uh, one person out, I noticed, which is yourself. How'd you get into this? <laughs> that? How did, you, how did you get into solving this problem? I mean, um, uh, you and I have known each other. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing you for a little bit of time now, Ian, and uh, e- even before you started Apex. Um, but you have a very interesting um, background um, from you know when you started your career to how you ended up in the space industry. So tell us a little bit about that. I like to think it all came full circle. But I grew up here in Los Angeles. We're headquartered here in LA. We're in Culver City. I grew up in uh, the San Fernando Valley. And for me, when I was growing up, I always loved space. I everything to do with space, I was obsessed with. Right uh, on weekends, uh, I would go out with my dad to you know the middle of the desert and launch model rockets. I would beg my parents to take me to the gun store, not to buy guns, but to buy black powder, <laughs> so I could try to build my own rocket engines. For the record, I have all ten fingers still uh, and set zero forest fires. So that's very very good. 
Um, and I, I, I just loved the idea of space and rockets in this whole world. And then I ended up going to college at MIT, and uh, I was very lucky to get some incredible exposure while I was there to this world of um, dual-use technology, right? So the idea that technology that was developed there could be applied both commercially and to the government side. And I worked in a research lab that was funded by the Department of Homeland Security and got to work extensively kind of in that space. But while I was there, uh, frankly, I shifted a little bit away from aerospace. And the reason for that was um, during my years uh, in undergrad, it really felt like if I were to study aerospace, the path for me was to either go work for one of these you know, big defense prime contractors, uh, or uh, it was if I happened to be a billionaire, uh, it would be to like go start my own space company like Elon had done. And back then, like SpaceX was not a sure thing by any means, right? Like it was this crazy project. And you know, unfortunately, despite what I uh, you know joked about in the beginning of the show, my family really did not invent cinnamon, so certainly was not a billionaire and was not able to go start my own space company. And it, you know, and there's nothing wrong with working for one of these uh, you know established uh, prime contractors. Just I knew it wasn't for me. I I wanted a little bit more flexibility. I wanted to kind of uh, I had really that entrepreneurial spirit. So I shifted away from aerospace. And I ended up moving out to the Bay Area and living a very, uh, you know, typical, uh, you know, uh, Silicon Valley life. If you've seen the HBO show, I feel like many elements of my life were straight out of that show uh, for many years. Um, but then nearly a decade ago, uh, I decided to take what I had studied, the research lab that I had worked in back at MIT, and apply some of the latest learnings that I had had around artificial intelligence to it. And I started a dual-use technology company. Uh, we raised some great venture uh, funding, and we were building effectively uh, edge compute AI products. So it was a hardware and software company that worked with AI, but we were building it for both commercial and government applications. And then three years ago, uh, I sold that company to Palantir. And at Palantir, they had us take the AI platform that we had developed and apply it entirely to downstream satellite data. And for me, this was the, the biggest aha moment of my entire career. Because the satellite data that I was working with was coming from all of these commercial companies. And not only had I heard of many of these commercial companies, but I realized I knew some of these founders. And these founders were just like me, right? They had a great idea. They raised venture capital money. They raised a bit more than I had raised in my prior company. But with that money, they were able to get something up into space. They were not billionaires. They weren't working at a prime. They were able to do this, right? And that got me incredibly obsessed with this industry and where I started noticing, oh my God, just in the last couple of years, the cost has come way down to launch something into space. The, um, uh, the ability to build a payload and sell that data has gone way up. There is a beautiful industry here that's opening itself up. The barriers to entry are lowering a tremendous amount. So I, frankly, as I said, I became obsessed with this and I just started diving in incredibly deep, trying to understand, you know, what it would take to get involved. And throughout all of these conversations with well over 100 different customers on the government side and the commercial side, realizing that everyone really felt like they had similar pain points. The same bottleneck around these satellite buses was hitting everybody just in slightly different ways. And that's really where the idea for Apex was born. Um, it came out of just like feeling the pull from the market that this was a massive problem that they were all facing firsthand. No, that's a that's a that's a that's a really great point, and I think um, you have uh, such an interesting background because you have spent time as an operator, you have s spent time as an investor as well, which uh, gives you, I think, a unique insight in terms of like how to navigate, uh, you know, this market, right? Because like these last, um, I would say that you know the the growth and capital formation within the space industry really started to take place in the last few years, especially from the venture venture community. Um, and, you know, 2020, 2021, I mean, a lot of folks were getting funded and, uh, you know, there was not as much um, scrutiny on business models and companies. And obviously a lot of that has changed. Um, from your um, vantage point of having kind of sat in both seats and now sitting as an operator, um, what do you think about, you know, the current market? Um, and I know it's a big question, but I'm really specifically what, what I mean to say is for existing space companies and the fundraising market, um, you know, how are you at Apex thinking about sort of the next 12 months? And 
And yeah, how, how are you thinking? I, I, let's kind of keep it. Let's start there. How are you thinking about the next 12 months? So the first thing you have to do is just fully acknowledge like we're in a very interesting uh, economic time, right? There, you know, we, we are, the markets have completely shifted. It's incredibly hard to um, raise capital. The cost of capital with rising interest rates has gone up a tremendous amount, which means that every investor is now making that decision of, is this going to outperform you know, the Fed interest rates? Like, Is this a better bet than I could get somewhere else? And the end result of that is investors are a lot more discerning. And they are going to focus, in my opinion, on two core things. One of them is, is this a real business with real unit economics? Or is this more of an R&D project or you know, a science project that you know, is going to need a lot more money in order to thrive? And the second question is, what is the timing? Right? If we're able to deploy this capital now, how do we ensure that this company is going to make enough progress commercially, not just on the technology side, but you know, with actually selling real product? And that could be selling to government or to commercial, but you know, actually having real economics and real you know, sales coming in to be able to prove themselves enough to raise additional capital in the future or even be self-sustaining. And for us at Apex, like we take that to heart. So fundamentally, great unit economics are core to the business. And the goal of that is to be able to be a self-sustaining company that can continue to grow and thrive for years to come and not be reliant on external capital now, of course, we would love for external capital to speed us up further and accelerate everything that we're doing. But it's great to know that we're not the type of company that needs hundreds of millions of dollars in order to succeed, right? There's amazing launch companies out there, but you know, I don't think anyone has had a successful launch company with under $500 million invested. And Mo, you, you know the numbers better than I do, but keep me honest, but I think it's somewhere around there. Yeah, you're right. You're, you're right there. Um, and, uh, you know, we had, um, you know, and, and, I was actually just before we we were recording this, I was reading um, a piece published in CNBC on the Virgin Orbit story, and you know, talented team, um, really interesting idea, over a billion dollars of capital raised, right? And you know, it's 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 very tough. It's very tough. <laughs> very tough. So that's part of the reason we're so excited about satellite buses, right? We it's not like we can do this for no capital, but we need orders of magnitude less capital than a billion yep. dollars in order to be a sustainable, fast-growing company, right? Real unit economics, a real business that puts off uh, you know, positive cash flow that we can then reinvest into the business and grow it. And additional venture capital will let us grow faster. It'll let us you know, uh, innovate a little bit more, etc., which is, in my opinion, really what venture capital is best equipped to do. It's an accelerant more so than a required enabler. So, you know, look, in the early days, of course, part of it is being a required enabler to get started, uh, to be able to say no to customers that aren't a fit, et cetera. But I think in general, if you're in the space industry and you have a real business with real unit economics that makes sense, there's money out there, right? There are investors who are desperately looking for companies that, uh, you know, have real economics and they want to invest that capital. There is a lot of dry powder out there. Just these investors are a lot more discerning around what kind of companies they deploy them in. So um, I have a two-part question. And the first part, I'm going to actually even answer for you to, to, to speed things up. So the two-part question is, uh, will geopolitics be a big tailwind for the industry, both from a, from a capital perspective and just general activity perspective? The answer there is yes. I think you and I both know that, that's, that we agree on that. But I do want to know, to what extent do you think geopolitics is going to be a huge macro driver for the industry? Over the next ten years, I believe it's a w- one of the largest drivers of the industry. So, first in general, like space is a very pro entropic industry, meaning it thrives in chaos and change. Right? We don't want chaos in the world, but when there is chaos in the world, people tend to want uh, more things in space. They worry about the future of humanity with global warming. People worry about you know as there's uh, more terrible conflicts in the. Uh, world like the war in Ukraine, et cetera. We need more satellite coverage for communications, observation, et cetera. So in general, the more chaos and the more of a tumultuous world there is, I think the more um, the space industry will continue to grow. And that kind of leads us to the, I, I would argue, the second order question behind that, which is uh, you know, the fact that we're in a space race, right? Like we are in an active competition. And just to lay out some numbers for you, right? Uh, last year, China, the Chinese government launched 182 satellites, and the U.S. government launched 213. We are ahead, but we are barely ahead. 
by a sliver. And if you don't just look at two data points, but you actually look at the inflection curve, right? Uh, the Chinese government has announced their intention to launch a 13,000 satellite constellation. The U.S. can't produce enough satellites to be able to do that, right? That's the, the, there's no way to even compete there. So, you know, not not to say that you know uh, the CCP is just a singular you know um, uh, rival here that we need to go beat, right? Like, there's reasons to actually put things into space, and there's great businesses to be had. But I do think it's something that. Uh, when you talk about the macro, continues to push this industry forward and accelerate things. Yeah, and I think I think uh, it's a great point. And I think that speed of progress that's occurred in other countries is something that still is t- to me very remarkable. I mean, the example that I love to use is that you know we uh, when the U.S. and the Soviet Union first put uh, a, a human in space, and when China did, which was in two thousand three, many many decades later, I think we had our I think we sent the first human in space. I want to say in '61, perhaps. I think it was right. Anyway, but but my point is '61, um, 2003. Obviously, huge difference. And then that gap that's been bridged since 2003 till today. I mean, it's been it's there's a huge amount of progress and innovation. I know there's folks out there who 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 like to say, well, you know, if you actually dig in, you know, they're still very far behind. Um, you know, the China is very far behind U.S. from a technological perspective, but I think that that gap is closing very quickly, no matter where you think you are. So, um, uh, anyway, that's obviously going to be a huge tailwind for Apex, which is uh, which is which is a great thing. Now, um, in the few minutes we have left, um, I have a few kind of rapid fire questions, um, and uh, we don't have to spend maybe like maybe a minute max on each one. Uh, but first is uh, just. I love hearing this um, from people like mentors or figures that have helped shape their career, especially in this industry. So for, for you, who, who is that? For, in, oh, in, man. In, in the space industry, but a mentor or figure that really helped propel your career in the space industry. I, I would actually give a shout out to um, uh, my good friend, uh, Laura Crabtree here. So Laura runs a company uh, called Epsilon3. Um, I met her well before she started it, right when she was uh, leaving SpaceX and kind of thinking about what was next. And she has been, uh, you know, just an incredible friend on this journey, thinking about, you know, the good and the bad and, uh, you know, the industry and where there's opportunity and where there's not and where things are overhyped. So uh, she's been just an incredible resource that, uh, you know, I can't thank enough uh, for help, uh, you know, over the years. Yeah, Laura's great. Laura was actually one of uh, Payload's earliest friends. So she, uh, we, we were with her when she started Epsilon Three, and uh, uh, she's she's great. So I love that answer. I was yeah. hoping I was hoping I was Payload's earliest friend, but uh, it's fine. It's it, fine. It's, it's you know, uh, did you um, did you know about us when you were at Village? I did. Oh yeah, I knew. I knew. I, I was. A, I, you should go look at who the earliest subscribers were. But yes, <laughs> okay. I definitely did. That is something I, I can look up, but I will take your word for it. Um, what um, so? What company other than your own? Let's call it startup. What startup other than your own are you most excited about in the space industry? <laughs> oh man. Okay. So you know, look, as somebody who supplies satellite buses, right? We see a lot of uh, different uh, potential customers and people that we're working with that have these amazing visions of the future. And the one that I just cannot get off my mind that just gets me like incredibly excited every day when I think about what we're doing. Is this company called Astroforge? They're mining asteroids, um, you know, it, which has been tried before, but uh, they just have a very just like move fast, break things approach. I think they have a first launch coming up, uh, what in a few weeks or a month or something, uh, where they're actually going to refine asteroid material in space before they actually go to an asteroid. It's just their pace of uh, 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 of just acceleration is incredible, and the end application of what they're doing, I think, really pushes the limits of what today's satellites can do. And that excites me. What is your uh, favorite way to waste an hour? <laughs> oh, man. So I, uh, I wouldn't call this a waste because I think it's like a very valuable hour. But uh, I love when my wife and I take our dog to the dog park and just see him having a blast running around. Um, it's just like a great escape. It's like the polar opposite of building satellites. Uh, but it's like the perfect mental break for me. What kind of dog do you have? Uh, he's a he turns two actually in a few days on April tenth. Uh, he's a Havanese, so uh, he's uh, a small like a uh, thirteen pound dog. Incredible! I never thought I was a small dog person until I met him, and you know uh, he's my best friend. What can I say? All right. Well, if you send me a po- if you send me a picture, we can superimpose a photo 
in this last oh, one. Incredible. And so everyone can see what's the dog's name. So this is the best part. At Apex, we name all of our satellite bus models after dogs in the office. Oh, that's so great. Uh, that's Aries good. is his name. Oh wow. Uh, and then Max, my incredible co-founder, his dog is named Nova. And Nova is bigger than Aries, so Nova is our next size class of satellite. <laughs> but I'll send you both pictures and then uh, you know, we could see what uh, movie that. magic you can do. I love that. I love that. That's great. Well, uh, Ian, thank you so much for being on the show. It was a wonderful, wonderful to have you. Pleasure to have you. You're always welcome back. Um, and very excited to see the progress that you and the rest of the Apex team make uh, for uh, the, the, the satellite industry and the, and the space industry at large. So thank you again for being on the show. Of course. Thanks, Mo. It's been a pleasure. Mm-hmm.